Hello, my name is Glenn Butner. I am Assistant Professor of Theology and Christian Ministry at Sterling College, and this is the first of a two-part lecture entitled Crying Wolf, The Overblown Fear of Critical Race Theory's Infiltration into the Christian Church, a Methodological Critique of Neil Shinvey. This is part one, which I'm entitling Five Yellow Flags. So who is Neil Shinvey? Well, he's an apologist, a Christian. Uh, he is a theoretical chemist, and recently he is a an informal leader of an informal movement to expose the purported threat of critical race theory in the church. Uh, he's made the circle of podcasts, published in places like Gospel Coalition. He's given a number of talks and published an extensive paper with Ratio Christi, um, and so forth and so on. Now, typically I don't respond to um, concerns that I see in the world of Christian internet, for example, or the uh, podcast realm. Uh, but in this case, I felt the need to provide these lectures because in various contexts, like pastoral friends across the country, former students uh, at a campus diversity initiative I'm involved with, and in the context of a nonprofit I'm engaged with, uh, we keep having objections raised to uh, very basic levels of engagement with issues of racial injustice, raising the concern that this is critical race theory. And whenever I ask, I'm always directed back to Neil Shinvey as the source of these individuals' concerns. So I've been aware for a couple of years of Shinvi's work and have seen a number of flaws with them, but at this point I think it will be helpful to provide a more substantive critique uh, for Shinvi's use, but also for use among these individuals in my ministry circles. Odds are, if you are watching this video, you're familiar to an extent with critical race theory, but just to make sure we're on the same page, let's define that with Shinvi's definition. Uh, Shinvi and Sawyer in a document entitled Engaging Critical Theory in the Social Justice Movement published through Ratio Christi, uh, I believe their most extensive treatment to date of which I'm aware, um, provide three basic aspects of critical race theory. The first being that our identity as individuals is inextricably bound to our group identity, such that our experience of reality, our evaluation of evidence, our access of troop, truth, excuse me, our moral status, and our moral obligations are all largely determined by our membership in either a dominant oppressor group for example, whites, the wealthy, men, or subordinate oppressed groups, for example, uh, persons of color, um, women, uh, the LGBTQ plus community. The second aspect is an emphasis on li liberation. So if you ask what is social justice that we're pursuing, critical race theory will answer it refers to liberation, and especially liberation from certain hegemonic powers that oppressor groups have both intentionally and unintentionally used to subordinate oppressed groups. Third aspect of critical race theory is that it includes an understanding of how our social location, so our membership in dominant or subordinate social groups, impedes or enables our perception of truth. So three aspects of critical race theory for, for the time being and expectedly throughout both lectures, I don't intend to substantively challenge this understanding of critical race theory. A few more preliminary disclaimers before I dive into my remarks. First, I'm well aware of the biblical mandate to take concerns to an individual directly before pursuing a wider audience, so I should note that the basics of these objections I've already attempted to present to Shinvi over several occasions for uh, at least a year or two, and I have been unsuccessful. I think this is partly because much of Shinvi's work is spread through social media, which is frankly just not a good context to raise these sorts of concerns. So I believe these lectures are my best way of presenting to Neil my concerns um, as a brother in Christ in hopes that he can change a lot of what he's been doing. However, I also think I need to make these resources available to a wider audience at this point because, as I've said, Shinvi's thought has spread throughout many ministry circles where I am involved. Second, this may surprise some, I have no intention of defending the worldview of critical race theory. So, uh, Shinvi... Uh, and Sawyer on, um, in their document at Ratio Christi on page 23 claim that critical race theory serves as a functional worldview for the individuals that accept it. In other words, it is the fundamental explanation of the world, its purposes, who we are as individuals, and so forth and so on. Shinvi and Sawyer argue that there are Christians who may have adopted critical race theory as their functional worldview as well. That will be the premise that I intend to argue against. Um, specifically, the challenges that Shinvi has posed to a number of Christian individuals, accusing them of falling captive to critical race theory as a worldview. That will be the bulk of my second lecture.
Third, I should be clear that I'm restricting my critique here to the methodology of Shinvi and its implications for the church. Now, given the limited knowledge I have of Shinvi's theology and ethics, there might be points of disagreement between us there as well, but they are not the subject of these two talks. And I am certainly not intending to go after his character. I believe these flaws are methodological, uh, not anything intentionally meant to mislead. With that out of the way, I'd like to introduce you to what I'm calling yellow flags. The yellow flag being a symbol of a cautionary warning. These are aspects of an argument that when you see it, uh, you should take pause and be cautious. They don't automatically result in an argument failing, but wherever a cautionary warning is found, when you find one of these yellow flags, it does greatly increase the chance that the argument is being derailed and does not work. Now, these five flags are ones that I've seen across Shinvi's corpus. They're recurring problems uh, that I see in his work. And so I'd like to equip you and ideally Shinvi to be better able to identify these and avoid them. To do that, I'm going to offer a close reading to a recent publication of his on his blog, Shinvi Apologetics. Note the source at the bottom of your screen. Um, entitled, Does Systemic Racism Exist? Uh, you see the introduction to his text there anytime throughout. If you want, you can pause it and read it or pull it up on your own screen. Um, but from henceforward, anytime you see text with a black outline like this, it comes from either this source or another that I will identify. That should allow you to distinguish between Shinvi's text and my own ideas contained on this PowerPoint. Which, by the way, sorry, it's a bit weak. I've got other job responsibilities that prevented me from making this too flashy. Back on subject. What's the purpose of this article? Well, he notes the growing concern about systemic racism, but notes that people ignore the fundamental question of what is systemic racism. And by the time we get to the end of his article, he will be claiming that the definition offered of systemic racism is one that is deeply problematic. And this is a major concern. How does he get there? Well, first he begins by noting that there are not many explicit definitions of systemic racism. Rather, uh, there are many implicit or implied definitions, and he gives us two of these from an academic context. Ibram Kendi claims that a racist policy is any measure that produces or sustains racial inequity between racial groups. Racist policies have been described by other terms, institutional racism, structural racism, systemic racism, etc. Note the highlighted terminology. We'll come back to that. Second definition from Sensoy and D'Angelo uh, it says that racism refers to white racial and cultural prejudice and discrimination supported by institutional power and authority used to the advantage of whites and the disadvantage of peoples of color. Racism encompasses economic, political, social, and institutional actions and beliefs that perpetuate an unequal distribution of privileges, resources, and power between white people and peoples of color. This is our first cautionary flag. That is the example of limited or weak evidence. Now, many who are listening to this or watching this video are probably aware of this one, but I want to make sure I name it. As a general rule, the stronger the claim that you're making is, the stronger uh, the evidence that you need is to back up that claim. Uh, there are various types of weak evidence, including uh, lack of context. Uh, so providing a quote without any larger context of where it came from, which is one reason I'm working through one of Shinvi's documents in its whole. It's a limited quantity of evidence. It's anecdotal evidence, so just a random story instead of larger empirical data or a larger selection of incidents to prove your point. In this case, the concern is that Shinvi argues there are not any uh, academic explicit definitions of systemic racism, really, that there are only implicit ones. The problem with this is uh, that even on Shinvi's own site, he's able to provide us some definitions that better and explicitly fit this subject. So Shinvi's document, Anti-Racism Glossary, dash racism, is able to cite several specific definitions uh, that explain institutional and systemic racism quite easily. Why is it that there he's able to give us an explicit definition from an academic context, and here he doesn't give us one? So he's critiquing the definition, but he's not even giving us a good source of that definition. It's a problem. Again, this is uh, prevalent through us, throughout Shinvi's corpus. Uh, main example I'm concerned about is his document, Critical, or excuse me, Christianity and Critical Theory Part 3, Critical Theory in the Church, where he argues that critical theory has influenced the church in massive ways, but his evidence consists of a collection of anonymous quotes uh, 
We don't know who the author is, we don't have any context, and a number of screen captures from social media, Facebook and Twitter and so forth and so on, to show this threat. That's very flimsy evidence for a very substantive claim, given that Shinvi and Sawyer argue that critical race theory is a functional worldview that is antithetical to Christianity. You need strong evidence for strong claims. So keep that in mind whenever you're reading Shinvi's work, or other works for that matter. Moving back to Shinvi's text, he gives three popular definitions. A USA Today article defines systemic racism uh, as systems and structures that have procedures or processes that disadvantage African Americans. Note disadvantage there. An ABC News article refers to a system in which public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, and other norms work in various, often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequity. Note the highlighted word again. Finally, Vox. The phrase systemic racism is used to talk about all the policies and practices entrenched and established institutions that harm certain racial groups and help others. Note the word harm highlighted there. Immediately after this, Shinvi provides his own definition. Uh, systemic racism would be defined something like systems which create or perpetuate racial disparities. Note the highlighted word. And with it, we will introduce our second cautionary flag, which is a definitional shift. Any time that you change part of a definition, uh, you're exposing yourself to a high likelihood of committing some logical problems, some mistakes, perhaps equivocation, where you begin an argument with one definition in mind, one meaning of a word, and you change the meaning of that word partway through, the argument generally doesn't work. Another example would be a straw man. You're critiquing a position, but you attribute a meaning to a word that they don't accept, so what you're critiquing is not actually that position at all. Let's look, in this case, at the specific definitional shift. Systemic racism, according to the sources that Shinvi has provided, I believe, are best summarized uh, as systems that result in inequity. We've seen that word used explicitly in several places, and I also think it's implied in the language of disadvantage and harm. Now, inequity refers, just generally speaking, to a lack of fairness or justice. To really understand, we would need stronger evidence. What does uh, Kindy mean by inequity? Does he have a larger understanding here? And that's not provided, but we'll move on from that point for now. Systemic racism, according to Shinvi, uh, is a system which creates or perpetuates disparity. Now, disparity just means difference. So there's a disparity between my height and my wife's height, but it's not obviously evident that that disparity is also an inequity. It's something unfair or unjust. Not all disparities are inequities, and therefore this shift is significant, as we will see in Shinvi's argument. Uh, again, this is something that happens uh, fairly often in some of Shinvi's arguments. In fact, one of the main objections that has been raised to uh, Shinvi's understanding of critical race theory is that he has shifted the definition. I'm not going to get into that since, again, I don't really intend in these lectures to defend critical race theory. Um, so, moving on, back to the text from Shinvi. Given this definition of systemic racism, Shinvi admits that it exists, but he raises the problem that this definition is fundamentally flawed. Here is where Shinvi begins to move into his argument. And it's an argument that Shinvi enjoys. Uh, he uses it uh, relatively often in his blog, but I've also seen this sort of thing done regularly in his social media interactions. Uh, it's known as a reductio ad absurdum, a method of argumentation that attempts to discredit a principle or a set of principles by showing absurd conclusions that must follow from them. The idea here is if you accept the premises and they lead to absurd conclusions, then we have reason to doubt the premises in the first place. In order to make this argument, uh, he has to provide one more premise himself, and this is taken from the next section of his text, Racism and Disparities, and that premise is that since racism is evil, it ought to be dismantled wherever encountered. And according, because of this premise, Shinvi says that the definition provided of systemic racism is dangerous. It's dangerous. This raises yet another example of a cautionary flag, a yellow flag. This is an imported or an unestablished premise. What I mean by an imported premise is uh, a claim, an idea that is brought into uh, and included as among the views of a certain perspective, in this case, critical race theory or um, 
he hasn't named a critical race theory, but those are many of the sources that he's pointing to or representatives of that perspective. Um, an imported premise would be one that they haven't clearly affirmed. Now, this might just be an example of Shinvi not providing enough documentation to back this up, um, but it may also be a straw man. So we have to ask the question, would those who define systemic racism in this way accept this premise that any systemic racism must be dismantled? Second, though, is an unestablished premise. This is a claim where there's really no evidence given to back it up. We can ask, is this a rational premise? Superficially, it looks clear, but let's ask the question, why say that all racist systems must be dismantled and not reformed? Maybe a more rational premise is systemic racism, excuse me, systems that result in racial inequity should be dismantled or reformed. Uh, again, this uh, is a problem that we see uh, in various places in Shinvi's corpus, but for the purposes of time, I'm going to move on back to his text. He gives two reductio ad absurdums, which rather than providing you the text in the source, you're welcome to go there. I'm basically going to illustrate how the argument works by showing different premises in order here. I think these are fair representations of what he's saying there. Begin with Shinvi's definition of systemic racism. They are systems which create or perpetuate racial disparity. Uh, his premise that systemic racism should be dismantled. But then third, he says that marriage itself actually perpetuates racial disparity. The reason for this is that individuals tend to marry within their racial or ethnic group. And so uh, whites tend to marry other individuals who are white. Persons of color tend to marry within their own ethnic and racial groups. The problem is that more wealth is held by the white community than by persons of color in this nation. So by virtue of white uh, men and women getting married, for example, you wind up with uh, increased wealth in that family and not in other families, which clearly perpetuates disparity, a state of difference. Therefore, Shinvi concludes, marriage is an example of systemic racism and should be dismantled, which he rightly takes to be an absurd conclusion. Marriage uh, is a good gift from God, clearly scripturally defensible. More than that, there are very few things that you can threaten, in North American Christianity at least, that would be perceived as a greater threat than an attack on the family and marriage as an institution. So this is going to come across as a very big deal to his audience. If you accept this definition of systemic racism, you might wind up having to throw out marriage and the family altogether. Is this a good reductio ad absurdum? Maybe not. Suppose that we shift the definition. Instead of using Shinvi's definition, let's use the definition actually provided by the sources. Systemic racism refers to a system that results in inequity, a lack of fairness or justice. We'll keep for now his premise that systemic racism should be dismantled, but we can ask the question, is the institution of marriage itself unfair or unjust? Marriage clearly perpetuates disparity, but does it cause injustice? That's less clear to me. Uh, it's not at all obvious that this is an absurd definition on this ground. Now, you might still think that it is, so let's add another problem with Shinvi's reductios by turning to his second example. I think this is a failed reductio, but here's another one. Uh, this time, he starts with his definition, moves to his premise that systemic racism should be dismantled, and focuses on private property. After all, if I have property that I have rights to that can't be seized and redistributed, uh, then my wealth may impede uh, the progress in wealth of members of other racial groups. So therefore, it would be there's a disparity, so it's systemic racism and should be dismantled. Again, uh, if we accept the definition of racism, Shinvi argues, systemic racism, then we're maybe going to have to abolish private property. Capitalism being changed to communism. This is the sort of thing that's really going to scare uh, Shinvi's audience. Again, I think it's a weak uh, reductio, and we can see this if we revise the argument by getting rid of Shinvi's imported premise and adding another. Systemic racism should be dismantled or should cause reform. Now let's grant for now that private property, property may perpetuate inequity. Our current system of private property, certain laws that we have and the distribution of property might be unjust. Sure. Then it should be reformed or dismantled. 
So we don't have to go the communist route. There are other routes. This is not an obviously false premise. In fact, there's a long tradition of Christian history suggesting the exact same thing. Everything from the early church in Acts who voluntarily gave up private property. They admitted that houses were your own to sell and give to the Lord, but they voluntarily did that to more equitably distribute wealth so that everybody had what they needed. Um, another example, uh, much more recently and much more at home for evangelicals might be Wayne Grudem and Barry Asmus, who in arguing uh, about the causes of poverty around the world in various countries suggest that part of the problem is um, very labor-intensive property right laws, where it's far too complicated um, to secure your property rights through the legal system, and that this is a major barrier to economic growth and wealth. They would suggest, following economist Hernando de Soto, that we should reform property law, therefore to make things easier. That might be an acceptable solution here in some contexts. Um, Catholic social teaching, its official understanding of uh, the universal destination of goods, is very different from the American understanding of property. So once again, um, it's not clearly absurd that property law should be dismantled or reformed. So again, this is a failed re reductio. In other words, the only reason why Shinvi's argument works is because he shifts the definition and he imports a premise that is not obviously true. And then he connects that with the fear of if you accept this understanding of systemic racism, marriage and capitalism are under threat. Now, he does give a little bit of evidence for this that we'll turn to in a minute, but first, uh, let's look at some other examples of Shinvi making the same sort of mistake, combining a reductio ad absurdum with an imported premise. Um, two sources here, you can read the, the documents for yourself. Um, first, I'll talk about his short review of Tatum's Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Uh, he says that Tatum's understanding of systemic racism is wrong. Um, because again, this imported premise, he says, private schools and homeschooling can be shown historically to be at least partly rooted in prejudice. These phenomenon emerged when desegregation was happening in schools. If that's the case, this raises the question, Shinvi argues, uh, of whether we should outlaw private school and homeschooling. Again, he is attacking uh, something very dear to many conservative Christian hearts. We want to educate our children in a Christian context, but if I accept this understanding of systemic racism, I may have to give that up. The problem is he's imported the premise that um, if something is rooted historically in this prejudice, that it must be outlawed. That doesn't at all seem to be what Tatum would endorse herself, at least as far as he's demonstrated. Um, after all, much of Shinvi's critique of Tatum is that she's offered an alternative solution, that of affirmative action. So uh, he's adding a premise to make this reductio that really doesn't apply to Tatum at all. A second example is from his document, uh, Race, Class, and Gender, the Strengths and Weaknesses of the Ideology of the Social Justice Movement, Part 5. He notes that proponents of the social justice movement um, say that we should accept the experiences of others when it comes to things like sexism and gives the following story. Suppose... A woman comes forward and says, as a woman, I have personally experienced sexism, reading directly from his argument here, by the way. Then, Shinvi says, we're supposed to make the following inference. Sexism is objectively rampant in our culture. We can't object to this step because if we do, then we're invalidating her experience. So finally, we should reach the following imperative. We should dismantle the patriarchy. He then argues that, however, that we could make the inverse case that there might be a woman who's not personally experienced sexism, which might lead us to say that there is no sexism. So therefore, no action should be done. Problem is that I don't really see that he sourced the fact that moving from one case of sexism, we are required to make the following inference, which is that sexism is objectively rampant in our culture. That's something he has imported. Add the same argument with a different premise. As a woman, I've personally experienced sexism. Therefore, sexism exists in our culture. And it's not at all clear how that's problematic. Whereas it, the inverse, as a woman, I haven't experienced sexism, therefore sexism doesn't exist, is clearly illogical. So it's a failed reductio ad absurdum, only made possible because Shinvi imports an idea that's not clearly evident in the source. So what evidence does he give that people actually believe that uh, on the basis of systemic racism, these sorts of things should be abolished? 
The first is a quote from Edna Bonasic uh, in an essay where she argues that as long as we retain a capitalist system, we will not be able to eliminate racial oppression. Again, this is weak evidence. We don't really know the context here, um, what she means by capitalism. Capitalism can mean a lot of different things. Uh, arguably, it doesn't necessarily mean private property, uh, given that you can have private property in feudalism and mercantilism and gift exchange economies and so forth and so on. So we really don't have a lot of evidence there, but there's some. But he does add a second piece of evidence that's more what I want to focus on here. Uh, he points to recent calls to hashtag abolish the police uh, as an example of the fact that we should dismantle uh, problematic um, systemic racism. Cautionary flag four here, the pivot to social media sources. When you're evaluating someone's position or an entire intellectual tradition's position, pivoting away from a book, articles and essays to social media is just really poor form. This is the case for three reasons. Uh, first of all, the audience. Often on social media, you're writing to your followers who probably are following you because they're relatively on board with your ideas already. You don't need to persuade very clearly about what you mean. Second of all, authorial preparation. I've written one book. It took years of research and thought to make sure I very clearly presented my ideas. It was reviewed by a number of peers, edited by an editor. Even there, there are a few points where I ne wouldn't necessarily stand behind them today. A tweet, however, I might take three minutes thinking about and preparing. Finally, there's the limits of the platform. There just isn't space in a tweet to provide much context for what you mean. After all, the idea of abolishing the police means various different things to different people. Uh, defunding the police is actually the hashtag I've seen more. For some, it means decrease the percentage of budget going to the police. For others, it means um, replace uh, certain responsibilities of police for better trained social workers. And for others, it might mean dismantle uh, the entire police as a current institution and replace it with a different community uh, structure with comparable responsibilities um, in different forms. Why pivot to social media here? If this really is a valid premise, we don't need to turn to hashtags. You can find foolish hashtags about just about anything on the internet. But this is a common example of Shinvi's methodology. Here's another example. We'll see one in lecture two as well. Uh, Shinvi's A Short Review of Morrison's Be the Bridge pivots away from analyzing her book to critique her Facebook group policy because it doesn't allow adequate space for white individuals to object to the concerns of persons of color. He says that this is an example of critical race theory shutting down dialogue. That may be the case, but I've been a member of reformed Facebook groups that say that you aren't supposed to post things not in line uh, with the reformed confessions of the faith. I think more likely these sorts of concerns are just a byproduct of Facebook being filled with trolls and many Facebook groups trying to minimize trolling by shutting down debate in this way. It's a very weak form to pivot from a book that Morrison undoubtedly spent years thinking about and writing to critiquing the policy of a Facebook group that she's associated with. The conclusion of Shinvi's article. He says there are only logically two options available if we define systemic racism and systems which create or perpetuate racial disparities. Either we can agree that marriage, private property, law enforcement, and a host of other systems are manifestations of systemic racism and must be dismantled, or we can agree that some manifestations of systemic racism do not need to be dismantled because they are actually good and just. Since neither option is viable, we should adopt a different definition for systemic racism. Cautionary flag here is a red herring. A red herring is an intentional or an unintentional distraction from the more important matters at hand. Let's consider the context of what's going on in our country right now. We have national debates about policing method. Uh, about uh, the use of violence, uh, sentences, sentences in the criminal justice system, um, and various other racial inequities um, within the criminal justice system. We have debates about Confederate monuments being taken down, uh, about the appropriateness of protests, uh, about riots, um, questions about local budgets, social services versus policing, uh, and many more issues that are coming to the forefront. This is a context where arguably Christians should be doing very careful thinking about the role of police, about these issues of 
racial disparities and injustices and inequities uh, among different ethnic groups in our country. But we can imagine, uh, after someone has read this article, a Christian coming forward and asking, say, a pastor, what is the Christian response to systemic racism? And that pastor, after reading this article, rather than being equipped to answer questions about how Christians should think about policing, is able instead to answer with the response of, that term of systemic racism is problematic because your definition leads to some rather illogical conclusions. Let's talk about your vocabulary. The problem here, though, even though Shinvi would say, hey, this is important, we need terminological clarity. The problem is that the lack of clarity is entirely Shinvi's making. He invents this lack of clarity through a weak survey of evidence, not providing any explicit definitions of systemic racism. For example, uh, Kindy's definition is about a racist policy. Is marriage a policy? Well, that's not clear to me at all. Um, he gives a weak survey of evidence. He then distorts the definition that he finds in this weak survey to put forward his own definition. He imports a premise that he's not given us any argument for and that I see reason to doubt, which is that anything uh, which includes systemic racism must be dismantled. Um, he provides very little evidence that anyone holds this position, instead pivoting to a hashtag, a very weak form of evidence, um, and then provides this context to have a giant red herring of a conversation about vocabulary, when frankly we have more important things to be discussing as a church. Much of the premise of my second video lecture will be that Shinvi's entire project of identifying uh, the functional worldview of critical race theory in conservative Christian circles is itself a red herring based on fallacious methodology. Hopefully I've got a few people still listening that will come back to that lecture, but first, three quick conclusions. First, watch for those common yellow flags. Don't be misled. There's weak evidence, a shift in definitions, unestablished premises, a pivot to social media, or red herrings. There's a high likelihood that the article that you're reading is deeply problematic. Second, we need to consider the spiritual and ethical consequences of this entire project. Shinvi explained very early in his work that he's doing this because he saw a number of progressive Christians leaving the faith, which he attributed to their adopting the worldview of critical race theory. I have experienced other things in my circles. Individuals who for good reason have a Christian concern about injustices, which they could articulate in the context of Old Testament biblical prophetic mandates, uh, New Testament emphases on the poor, for example, in the Gospel of Luke, and so forth and so on, they raise concerns about how we should respond to these problems as Christians, and they are then accused of adopting problematic worldviews like critical race theory, and gradually pushed out of their religious community, which is a traumatic experience and drives them out of the church. I find that the greater risk in my own survey of what's happening in this country. So third, I think we therefore need to develop an alternative methodology to analyze critical race theory. We need to ask questions about, is critical race theory actually a functional worldview in the context of these Christians who allegedly are being corrupted in this manner? My second lecture will argue that that has not been established um, and that in fact, uh, I don't believe it is the case. The next lecture should be shorter. Hopefully some of you will come back for that. Thanks for listening. All the best.